Hey everyone, my name is Sebastian and I'm CTO and co-founder of DC Spark, a crypto ecosystem builder company. In this video, I want to talk about verifiable off-chain computation, why this is so important, and the novel research that we're working on to bring this to market. And not only us, but also partner companies in Milk Media and Pima Studios as well. So, you know, what is what is verifiable off-chain computation and why is it so important? Well, right now, currently blockchains have a problem where they're really stuck with one computational model. For example, stuck with EVM, stuck with Plutus, stuck with SVM. And these might not really be what you want for your specific use case. And the, the future we, we really want is that anybody can use any programming language they want on the blockchain and they can really target their specific use case and build something exactly for what they want. So, you know, to, to really give a concrete example of, you know, why this is a problem, let's talk about a blockchain I think probably everybody watching this video knows, and that's Ethereum. So what is the problem with Ethereum? Fundamentally, I mean, one of the problems, one of the fundamental problems is that the, all the smart contract execution happens directly on the layer one. Every time you make a transaction on Ethereum that calls a smart contract, not only do you have to run that smart contract, but everybody else on the network also has to run that smart contract and verify the result is accurate. And this ends up being slow. So it makes that the Ethereum blockchain can't really scale really well to a high transactions per second, because it's busy computing all these smart contracts with all these people. And not only is it slow, it's not even you know that great because it's expensive. So it ends up costing users a lot of ETH, a lot of money to run these contracts. So it's not even a great user experience. And the problem is that slowing uh, or fixing this slow and expensive leads to centralization. So you can imagine one easy way we could tackle this problem is if we told everybody, okay, run your Ethereum node in, in one specific data center, if everybody runs in the same data center with a few number of nodes, then we can you know have everything centralized and run way faster. And there are blockchains that tr try and tackle this, for example, Binance Chain, that's how they get a lot of their throughput. But that's not really a, a great you know way to solve the problem because you know the key value proposition of Ethereum and a lot of these blockchains is decentralization. And you want to solve this problem while maintaining the decentralization that you have. And you know, one of the even worse things about this is that, you know, by having the layer one computation kind of hard coded at the protocol level, it also makes it, you know, hard to modify. Hard to modify and also hard to update. And this is problematic because it's very hard for applications to add new functionality to the blockchain that they need for their specific use case. And also makes it hard to upgrade Ethereum itself. Anytime they want to make a new upgrade to the system, for example, when they move to proof of stake, they have to think, well, how does the how does this update affect the smart contract system on Ethereum? Will it add any new vulnerabilities? Will it add any problems in performance? You know, this really complicates the amount of th stuff you have to think about. And notably on the app, um, you know, application side, it really hampers, you know, a lot of potential innovation because a lot of the, the topics that you see in the recent crypto ecosystem revolve around people wanting to change the fundamental behavior of the layer one execution system. So for example, oops, you, you may have seen a lot of talk about royalties and trying to enforce royalties at the layer one, which is, was not a consideration during the construction of Ethereum or any of these other blockchains. You can also see a lot of people talking about new cryptography. So they want to add new cryptography to Ethereum, for example, for ZK rollups and these other kinds of applications, but they can't really because adding a, a new cryptography requires, you know, modifying or updating the current Ethereum uh, virtual machine stack. And then another one is kind of app specific precompiles. So Ethereum adds, has a way of adding functionality to Ethereum that doesn't require implementing the behavior in, in EVM or Solidity. So um, these are called precompiles. Oops. And the way they work is that you can write them, for example, in Go for Gef, and you say instead of running this specific behavior on EVM, run this specific behavior um, in this in a kind of arbitrary Go programming language contract with a very specific gas cost for executing this whole code block. And this is very common for specific applications that really wish they could have a pre-compile for their specific, you know, smart contract to make that smart contract be really gas efficient, their core functionality for their specific use case really efficient. And they can't easily do this on Ethereum because 
if they want to add a precompile, they need to convince the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem to add this precompile. And this is obviously not easy to do. And so having this virtual machine hardcore on layer one has been fairly problematic. So how are people solving this problem if it is problematic? Well, what everybody is trying to do at the moment, so everybody is trying to move to the off-chain computation model. So what does that mean concretely? It means that instead of the contract execution happening directly on layer one, it happens off-chain or in these layer two systems. So for example, Ethereum is moving to uh, layer two solutions like Optimism, ZK Sync, more as well as such as Arbitrum and the family of, of StarkNet solutions. Um, so you can, you've probably heard a lot of these names that are these layer twos on Ethereum where we're trying to move computation off chain. But this is not just an Ethereum trend. So for example, uh, Milkomita, Milkomita is a platform to add EVM support to non-EVM blockchains as a layer two, currently deployed to Algorand. There's also a side chain for Cardano as well. So you can see these other blockchains also trying to make, make the move. Um, Cardano also has, you know, some projects like Mamba and Input Endorsers that are also trying to move the computation off the main chain. Avalanche has this concept of subnets to try and, and move computation off into different subnetworks. There's projects like Pima Studios, which is trying to build kind of game specific layer two solutions. And so there's kind of a lot of ecosystems trying to move towards this off-chain model in their own way. I would say there's also, you know, one exception, which is Solana, which is kind of the counterculture where they're saying everybody's moving to off-chain and we're not going to, you know, really go that direction. We're not going to move to layer twos or any of these other solutions. We're going to focus really on having everything running on the layer one. So they're kind of an exception to this, um, but they may end up, you know, pivoting in the same direction as everybody else in the future. So I'm, I'm talking about, you know, moving to off chain, but I'm, I'm kind of plating terms, being a little loose with the terminology uh, because I'm, you know, talking about rollups in the same way we can talk about state channels and same way we can talk about other solutions and I'll see these work uh, fairly differently. So now what I like to do is kind of talk about, you know, three categories that I think are really important and how we as a company are trying to tackle these different categories. So first category, is multi-party. And I don't mean in the multi-party co party computation sense, um, but I mean when there's many people involved over a long period of time. So traditionally, this is a use case handled by rollups. When you want to have a long living system with multiple parties involved, executing transactions, deploying smart contracts, building a whole ecosystem on top of them. And obviously there's been a lot of research done on this kind of layer two solution, like I mentioned, optimism, ZK and Sing, and so on. One of these problems with these long lived multi-party systems is that users need to manually opt into these systems. So for example, if you're on Ethereum, you need to opt into optimism. You need to actually move to the layer two, call the contract in layer two, come back to layer one. And this is kind of a jarring user experience, but it's even more jarring when you're talking about, for example, Algorand, where you're moving from Algorand to Milkmeda, you're moving from one virtual machine to the other, from the AVM, the Algorand virtual machine, to the EVM, and that requires usually a different wallet. So Flint Wallet, you know, is a product that we're working on that will hopefully add support for Milkmeda for different chains, um, but currently it does not have that functionality yet, and so it means that if you want to use Milkmeda for Algorand, you need to have an Algorand wallet, and for example, MetaMask or another EVM compatible wallet, and this is kind of a, a not a great user experience to have to have multiple wallets. And so we've been working on a concept called wrapped smart contracts. Wrapped, oops, let me undo this. Wrapped smart contracts. And the, the concept is that we want to allow people to call layer two smart contracts directly from the layer one from their existing wallet. So for example, with an Algorand wallet, you'll be able to call a smart contract that exists on the layer two um, without having to go install MetaMask or any kind of EVM specific wallet. But there's actually a few different challenges to building this kind of wrapped smart contract system. Uh, one is you need some kind of fixed address. And the reason this is important is because a lot of use cases on these rollups depend on iterating 
uh, having repeated interactions with a system. So for example, if you're thinking about games, you may want to play a game from the layer one using wrap smart contracts. And each time you submit a new move to the game, you don't want to create a whole new profile, a whole new game session. You want to contribute to your, your existing game session. So they need to be somehow reusable. Uh, you need to support, you know, games and profiles and so on. So this is, you know, complication number one, but obviously this can be handled. Another complication is it has to be able to survive attacks, malicious attacks. So, you know, one kind of attack that could happen is front running. So if somebody sees that you're about to do a computation on the layer two, they may um, be already have funds in layer two, so they may be, may be able to interact, for example, with the DEX before you two, uh, before you do. So the wrap smart contract system needs to have a way to basically be able to abort fast. If it gets on layer two and it sees that somebody has kind of front run you, it should be able to abort the computation and not have you uh, potentially suffer losses because of it. So it needs to survive these front running attacks and also it needs to survive also replay attacks. So replay attacks is when you take an existing transaction that's already been executed and you execute it again. So you replay the same transaction and this is not great because imagine you want to buy five tokens and somebody replays your transactions, they could potentially force you to buy another five. So you'd be at 10, 15, 20. And so it needs to survive any kind of replay attack. And so these are two challenges that we, we, we've been handling. Third one is speed. So obviously going from the layer one to the layer two is not instantaneous. And then also going from layer two back to layer one is not instant instantaneous as well. So there's a, a user experience hit from the performance of having to do this kind of uh, migration from layer one, layer two under the hood. And the way we've been tackling this is with a project called Multiverse, which is a project we've been developing to try and improve finality times for protocols like Cardano that have slow finality by basically monitoring different nodes across the world and checking their mempools and checking if these mempools have any potential contradiction that might lead to forks in the future. And so this is something we've been particularly working on for chains like Cardano that have slow finality, uh, but also not as useful for chains like Algorand that have instant finality. Uh, but it's something that we've been working on to tackle the, the speed to make sure that the um, usage of wrapped smart contracts still stays fast. And another one is verification. You know, how do you make sure that the person who is executing this layer two transaction is really the, the person from the layer one? And to tackle this, we've been re writing some pre-compiles for Milkumita. For example, we've added a SIP8 pre-compile, which is the Cardano standard for message signing. So it's a message signing standard that I actually wrote many years ago. And it allows you to sign messages to make sure that you're really the, the author or the owner of this address. And so we added this SIP8 pre-compile to Milkmeet C1, for example, so that now uh, whenever you're seeing a wrap smart contract, we can verify that um, this transaction really comes from the owner of this layer one address. So these are some of the, the main cha challenges we've been tackling with wrap smart contract. And we've been working on this for a few months now, and we're currently aiming to release the first version in Q1 for Cardano, and we'll be releasing the version for Algorand as well uh, fairly soon after, I believe. And so look forward to that. But obviously, multi-party computations are, are not the only kind of, of computation that exists. There's also uh, fixed sets. Uh, kind of fixed party or fixed um, set of people. And this also usually involves state channels. So like Lightning, uh, Hydra, these kinds of state channel solutions, oftentimes they work best when you already have channels set up with the entities you want to talk to. And if these are a fixed set of, of people. And so this is not really a, an area that we at DC Spark have been looking much into, um, but other companies are such as, you know, people working on Lightning and um, IOG with, with Hydra as well. There's actually a third kind of, you know, 
category that I think is, is really important that we've been looking into a lot recently at DC Spark, and that's single party. Right, so what if this is not a long-lived system? And what if this is not even a system with other people involved? It's not a fixed system either. It's just you, right? And, and why is this important? There's actually, you know, two cases where I think this is important. One of them is one-way messaging. So we talked about wrap smart contracts as a way to go take data from the layer one to the layer two, and then bring this back to the layer one. There's, there's cases where all you care about is unidirectional message passing. You care about triggering an action layer two, and you don't care what the answer is. As long as you got your data there, you're good to go, right? So single party is kind of an interesting uh, way to model this kind of unidirectional message passing. But I think another really interesting use case is something like HTTPS oracles, which is something that projects like Mina have been working on. Oops, Mina, which is a way to get oracles bootstrapped by relying on the HTTPS protocol that secures the existing web infrastructure we have today. So what if you could, for example, leverage the Coinbase Oracle by signing the Oracle using the HTTPS cryptography from the actual website that um, the Coinbase price feed is hosted on. So this is kind of an interesting way to leverage existing infrastructure in the internet to build oracles. In which case, you're not really interacting with anybody else. You're just a single party who is taking data from an existing source, posting that data to the chain, and proving that this data is correct. And so this is kind of an interesting instance of single party computation. And I think there's a lot of other really interesting instances of, of single party computation in ZK research, for zero knowledge research where you may want to run a computation and prove this computation is correct. And this computation doesn't necessarily involve another party. It may just be a proof about the state of your wallet. You want to upload to the blockchain a proof that your wallet contains an NFT without revealing what your wallet is or, or this kind of behavior. And so we're doing a lot of research right now into this, this kind of topic. And we're hoping to bring this to market to, for example, uh, Cardano, Algorand and potentially other blockchain partners so that we'll, we'll be announcing in the future. Now, obviously this has some limitations, which is that it, to really power these use cases, we may have to do modifications to the core blockchain itself. So for example, there's one kind of well-known signature scheme called BLS and a lot of zero knowledge research uses this signature scheme and there's other ones as well. Uh, but this is crucially not currently available in Algorand or Cardano. Algorand plans as this, and Cardano's talked about adding this, but neither of them have it yet, which is kind of an example of, of you know, cool R&D proposals that we can bring to the table, but will require us to work directly with the layer one blockchain teams to implement any kind of changes to the cryptography required to enable this. But it's something we're super interested in. We're really looking into the work that Mina is doing, and we'll have more announcements on the kind of results of our R&D and, and roadmaps based off of this in the future. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting use cases we can bring to existing blockchains by really leveraging uh, these kinds of zero knowledge protocols. So if you want to follow us on this journey, be sure to tune in for more. So follow us on YouTube, on Twitter, on D uh, Discord, all these platforms. You can look up DC Spark and find more information about us. And we have a lot of stuff coming up with our own projects that we're involved with, like Milk Mita. We have stuff that will be, you know, also related to ZK Research that we're looking into. There's other kind of partner companies like Pima Studios that's working on Layer 2 game engines. And they have a lot of really interesting thoughts about how to handle some of this multi-party computation. And, uh, you know, this, this is kind of a really interesting time in boxing right now for a lot of, you know, really interesting research. And I'd love for you to be on this journey with us. And thanks for listening. Hopefully you learned something new in this video today.